Thank you all. What a kind and obliging crowd you are. Kia ora koutou and welcome to this Christchurch NZ Economic Update, which is the very first for our newly formed agency, Christchurch NZ. My name is Joanna Norris, I'm the Chief Executive of Christchurch NZ and today I have with me members of our senior leadership team. The format for today is that we'll be taking you through the economic insights for the previous quarter and then running a panel discussion with members of my senior team where we'll answer all of your questions and yes, both the hard ones and the easy ones. It's our great pleasure to be sharing these insights with you today, but also to give you some insight into the role that our organisation plays in the wider Christchurch ecosystem. So I'll be talking a little bit today about the role that we play in terms of stimulating the economy, when we intervene and when we don't, and also the role that we play serving the community. And that's all of you in this room, but also the people of Christchurch and the people that we welcome here. Now this event is being live streamed, so now is the chance for you to turn off that cell phone or, or risk being embarrassed on YouTube forever. Um, so as I say, I'm going to provide some background as to why Christchurch NZ exists, what we're doing to intervene in the economy, and what we do to serve this community, but also what all of us in the room can do to make sure that we really truly understand the disruption that is occurring across our economy and take responsibility for raising the bar. <coughs> But firstly, a very brief history lesson. Uh, Christchurch NZ was formed way back on July 1 this year. Uh, we were a merger of the Canterbury Development Corporation, Christchurch and Canterbury Tourism, major events from within council and international education. We are fully owned by the Christchurch City Council and grateful to our shareholder. But we are independent in thought and voice and we have a, an independent and autonomous board and a range of funding partners. We've developed a clear mission for our organisation that unites our team and all of our activity. And that mission is to ignite bold ambition for Otatahi Christchurch. This mission informs all of the activity we do across three core pillars. So we, in order to ignite that bold ambition, we create excitement, we connect change makers, and we grow confidence across the region. We have an ambition of ensuring that Christchurch grows its reputation, not only as a wonderful place to live with beautiful beaches and mountains, and I hope that many of you had a chance to get to the beach this weekend with those scorching uh, temperatures, but also as a place where we can truly experiment and innovate in business, technology, and society a place where we can have meaningful and powerful careers, as many of you in this room have, a place where we can run sustainable and exciting businesses, a place that welcomes our visitors and is internationally regarded as a place to try new things. So to support this vision, we've organised ourselves around three core and very important pillars of activity. Number one, to grow an innovation and business growth ecosystem. We do this through business support programs, we work with partners, and we connect those with ideas, with those with the expertise and knowledge and resources to get stuff done. Number two, we provide economic insights, leadership, thought leadership, and strategy and policy knowledge. And today's economic um, update is part of that stream of work. And number three, we work really hard to grow and promote the attractiveness of our destination, making sure that we're prioritising new attractions, new innovation, major events, and a vigorous international and national promotion program. So I'm now going to run through the economic um, update, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the role that we're playing to help stimulate the economy. So as all of you in, in this room, I'm sure, are aware, institutional economists have been predicting a forecast, forecasting rather a softening of the economy for some time. Last week in his first major speech, Finance Minister Grant Robinson continued to foreshadow that softening over the next two years as this government um, realises its ambition of moving from a low-wage economy to an innovation-led economy supported in part by R&D tax credits and, of course, new migration settings. National business confidence, meanwhile, has fallen, partly, we think, in relation to that forecast of a softening economy, but also, of course, uncertainty around a change of government. 
Grant Robertson next week will deliver the half yearly fiscal update and that will include Treasury's economic indicators but also a full costing of the 100 day plan and of course a reversal of the previous government's tax cuts. Now these policy shifts provide both an opportunity for Canterbury but also a threat, particularly around migration settings and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But before I look forward, I do want to talk about some of the trends that we have observed over the past quarter and the years before. So firstly, the big picture, gross domestic product. Now this graph will be very familiar to many of you. Uh, the shock of the earthquake and the subsequent stimulus are uh, very clearly articulated there. If I can work the laser, you can see here. And as you can see, growth rates have been declining from that construction peak in 2014 and have declined over the past two years, but we've had a slight recovery in overall GDP growth in the past quarter. As many of you in this room know, we have had a two-speed economy operating here in Canterbury. Number one, the rebuild economy, and two, the underlying economy or the business-as-usual economy. Now that business as usual economy is really coming into play as that rebuild stimulus continues to fall away. So we're now describing the economy as low growth overall, but with still very high levels of activity in the underlying economy. So if we turn to volumes then, I quite like this graph, you can see that activity still remains really high within the Canterbury economy in terms of outputs. So while output growth is plateauing, as you can see from the graph behind me, volumes still remain at incredibly high levels. And if we look at unemployment, uh, this is a 15-year graph. You can see Christchurch in green, Canterbury in red, and New Zealand in blue. Now we all know the city and region have come off an extreme low period of unemployment in that post-quake period. Prior to that, New Zealand correlated really closely with the national average, and we've seen more recently that Canterbury and Christchurch have started to shift back towards that national average. But then this year, another change, and you can see that we are moving again away from the national average. Now this low unemployment in indicates to us the key strength of some of those sectors that sit within the underlying economy. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But this is really good news because it indicates that there is ongoing strength and confidence in our economic positioning. But it also signals that ongoing constraint that many businesses are facing in terms of the ability to attract the right skills and enough workers. So this next graph is one of my personal favorites because what this shows is some of the dire predictions that we saw in the post-quake period about massive employment losses once that rebuild declined are not being borne out in reality. As you can see, the construction sector employee numbers have declined around 3% down. Point over there. Um, but we're seeing really, really good growth in other sectors, and notably manufacturing, a traditional area of strength, HOSPO, and also here in uh, technology and telecoms, albeit off the low base. So what this shows is we are diversified as an, an economy, and we're seeing real growth in that underlying economy. So migration, then, another important indicator. Uh, what this graph shows us is, sorry, green is net migration, blue is arrivals with the intention to stay more than 12 months, so our long-term arrivals, and grey is departures. As you can see, there's still strong growth for migrants into Canterbury, and that's partly a reflection of those very, very low unemployment uh, levels that I showed you on that previous slide. Now, Many, as I said before, many businesses rely heavily on migrant labour to fill both skills shortages and labour force gaps, and forecast changes to the migration settings pose some real risk to the sectors that are reliant on migrant labour. The Canterbury Mayoral Forum, and I think some of you are represented in the room today, has worked really hard with central government to continue to reinforce the message that changes to migration settings pose a real risk to this economy. And we view that there is still more work to do in that area to communicate very clearly to Wellington the risk this poses to our economy. So looking then at uh, short-term visitor arrivals, so these, these are our visitors who are coming here for business or on holiday. 
Um, we all know the visitor economy was one of the worst affected sectors after the quake. Um, we became a place that wasn't great to visit for a short period, but we're back. We're in a position to recover, and this has been a significant priority over the past 12 to 18 months. So it's reassuring to see that visitor arrivals are climbing back up, and they're tracking back up to where they should be. But post-quake, there were real structural changes in the visitor economy and increased competition, particularly from Queenstown in partnership with Auckland Airport, and we know we won't get our visitors back by right. Christchurch International Airport is working incredibly hard to ensure that it has continued to be positioned as the gateway to New Zealand and the gateway to the South Island, and all of us need to support those activities. We will not get these visitors back by right. But Christchurch is still a strong player. We have a good proposition as a destination. We are now an exciting place to visit, and we need to continue to tell that story. So consistent with that rise in um, visitor arrivals, we're also seeing a subsequent growth in visitor spending, which is great news. They're coming, and they're spending a bit of cash. But this picture really does just represent the growth nationally. We have lost market share, and we need to continue to work really hard to make sure that we are benefiting from the nationwide tourist boom. And this next slide's really interesting. This is guest nights. So having seen those slides on increased visitor numbers and increased spending, you would expect that to correlate into guest nights. Surely, they have to stay somewhere. But this data appears to suggest that we're not converting international arrivals into bed nights. Guest nights are flat, and this is something of a contradiction. <coughs> There is the impact of the bounce rate as people come into Christchurch International Airport and then travel directly to the regions, but that doesn't explain the entire gap. So we're gonna offer a couple more insights in a moment. But first of all, I'm going to hand over to the very talented, our very talented General Manager of Strategy and Policy, Steve Purdia, who's going to talk a little bit about the housing market and yes, Airbnb. Steve. Thank you very much, Joe. So I'm just going to talk about our two areas of research that we're doing at Christchurch NZ. Uh, one of them is uh, a little uh, spotlight on the housing market, and we're also going to look at uh, visitor accommodation. So first impressions on this graph, median sale price, is that it looks like uh, there's an oversupply of housing in our uh, residential property market. Historically, uh, Christchurch in the green, Canterbury in the red, has tracked very closely to the New Zealand average of median sale price. But around about three years ago, if we zoom in closely on that, we can see that uh, Christchurch and Canterbury median sale price started to separate away from uh, the national average, suggesting to us that perhaps there is an oversupply of housing in the, uh, in the residential property market. So we decided to have a little bit of a deep dive into that and look at a few other indicators. Um, interesting, building consents for residential. Christchurch is in the red and New Zealand is in the blue and New Zealand uh, numbers are on the left-hand column and the Christchurch numbers are on the right-hand column if you've got the pack in front of you. Uh, what we can see has happened with building consents in Christchurch is, yeah, the uh, residential property market peaked around about, uh, with consents, around about late 2014, early 2015, and then as we expected, uh, we started to see a decline in the number of consent applications going into council. Uh, what's really interesting, though, is that over the last six months, it looks like uh, that growth, is, uh, that decline in consenting numbers has eased, and we've got a flat period, a flat flattening of that, and it looks like building consents are poised for rebound. And it's interesting to look at where that average line is now sitting compared to the historical average or the pre-quake average, suggesting that potentially we're in a new, uh, new normal for building consents, poised for growth, and it suggests to me that perhaps there is demand out there in the residential, price, uh, residential housing market. So we decided to explore residential consents a little bit further. And here, uh, what's been split out is new builds 
in residential and alterations in the blue. And in the red, the uh, building consent applications for new builds seems to track similar to the, previous, to the previous line. We saw that peak in late 2014, early 15, a building consents and then an easing and then this sort of potential new normal over the last six months here for new, new builds. But hello, look at, the, uh, look at the alterations. A very, very rapid increase in the number of building consents going in for alterations into residential properties. And that's not over six months. To us, that actually looks like around about a year, which is interesting. Now, we don't have any information at the moment on what those alterations might be, but we have been talking to people about it. And to us, it sort of seems like there's two pools for, the, uh, for those types of alterations. The first is those people who postponed doing alterations on their properties whilst the price of construction was quite high during that sort of rampant rebuild period of, um, of residential. The second pool uh, we've been hearing about is people who are doing alterations to their home, adding on self-contained units to enter into the Airbnb market. The next graph I, I just want to show you is, is another one that's interesting to me. Um, when I sort of think about um, the supply of houses in the residential housing market and that perhaps there is an oversupply, in my mind I was thinking, well, that means that houses are going to be staying on the market longer. So this is, this is a time to sell. And uh, in a normal market, um, a house will sit on, sit on the market for around about 28 to 42 days. So that's around about four to six weeks. So in my mind, I was thinking in Christchurch it might have been getting up to around about 40 or over 42 days. But it's really interesting because Christchurch is sitting at around about 33 days, which suggests to me that actually that's a, a, normal, a normal residential property market. The other interesting thing we found with this graph is that um, there's a very, very high correlation between New Zealand in the blue, uh, dark blue, and Christchurch, or Canterbury, in red. Unfortunately, we can't get this detail at a city level, it's at a regional level. But this very, very high correlation with the New Zealand average also suggests to me that actually Canterbury's housing market is very similar to the rest of New Zealand's housing market when you look at this graph in isolation from other graphs. It suggests to me that the demand supply picture is normal for Canterbury. So it doesn't make sense. Um, so from here, we've been left with more questions than we have answers. I mean, is low price growth being driven by an oversupply of housing? Uh, potentially, the price growth is being driven by actually an oversupply of rental and very, very flat rental growth, which is pegging back the capital value of housing. Or we've been starting to think, you know, is there actually a perception problem now in our market because it's been flat for a number of years? Do buyers and sellers just think there are more houses? So actually it's not driving uh, price growth. So we've got more questions and we've got answers and we're going to do a little bit more research and analysis into this area and we look forward to sharing that, those insights uh, with you as they come to light. Next I'm just going to talk a bit about Airbnb. So we heard Joe talk earlier about uh, the visitor, uh, visitor market in, in Christchurch. So what we know is that we've got very, very strong visitor arrivals. We know that we've got a good, strong uh, uh, visitor spend. You know, it's, it's around pre-quake levels, if not higher. But that's not transferring into guest nights. So that doesn't make sense. Um, so we've been making some assumptions that actually people are coming here, but we're not converting them into guest nights, and they're leaving straight away. So we thought we'd have a look at the Airbnb market because we know that in uh, guest night accommodation statistics, StatsNZ doesn't include the Airbnb um, market share that might be there. So we've had a little bit of a look at it. And it's very hard to get data on Airbnb. The first thing we found out is that 18 months ago, um, there wasn't an Airbnb market in Christchurch. Airbnb has had absolutely phenomenal growth. In 18 months, it's gone from zero to a 20% market share, this line here. In just 18 months, it's now 20% of the market. 
the visitor, guest, uh, the visitor accommodation market. And in the last 12 months, it's actually doubled. It's actually doubled the number of units it's got in its share. Quite incredible, really. The other thing we looked at is the utilisation of Airbnb. And what we found is when you look at all of the um, visitor accommodation in Christchurch and all of the visitor accommodation in, um, in Airbnb, that the utilisation rates are around about the same. What's really interesting is when you pull out houses from that Airbnb market and just look at the utilisation rate of houses, it gets up to over 60%. That's a really high utilisation rate. So it's starting to make sense of some of those building consents around alterations and some of that anecdotal story we've been hearing about people adding on units to enter into a very, very fast growing and quite a profitable market. So where are these houses in Christchurch? And with some geo mapping, we were able to uh, map where the houses are. Uh, your house might be on here as well, <laughs> who knows. What was really interesting about this uh, map for us is that actually they're everywhere in Christchurch. You know, it, but if we zoom in, there is a bit of a cluster up around Merivale, and there certainly is a cluster in around the CBD. And what this map of where they are is suggesting to us is that Airbnb, as a provider of guest accommodation, is actually providing a form of, of accommodation that is satisfying a portion of the market that wasn't being met by the existing accommodation providers. So what do you get for your money? So we just thought we'd pop up a picture from um, Airbnb. This might be your house, I'm not sure. Wouldn't that be funny if it was? This is a house up in Merivale. I'm going to do a little sales job now for Airbnb. If you're, if you're looking for some uh, visitor accommodation in Merivale, this is a three-bedroom home up in Merivale, and it's around $400 a night. Three-bedroom home. It also starts to make you think about some of the changing spending patterns of our visitors if, if a proportion of that market is actually taking accommodation like this that's slightly outside of the CBD. So what we did next was we took the data that we had and we tried to estimate how big the Airbnb market was and we put that on top of the Stats NZ uh, guest night data. And this is what it looks like. So that makes sense. We got really strong visitor arrivals around about pre-quake levels. We've got really strong visitor spend around about pre-quake levels. And when you add the Stats NZ guest accommodation with the Airbnb accommodation, we've actually got guest nights around about pre-quake levels. So I'm just going to leave you with that. That's about enough from me. Um, we just have a short video that we're going to show you next, which just takes a little bit of a deeper dive into the Airbnb market. Action! Oh. Since the earthquake, we had a lot of challenges with the accommodation sector. We saw a dramatic loss in terms of the accommodation stock in the city. As that grew and as demand grew, the variety of different types of accommodation became apparent. So now we have a really good mix in terms of hotel accommodation, motel accommodation, and the rise of the home sharing economy with players like Airbnb now in the city. As of about two years ago, we sort of could track a meteoric rise in the Christchurch context of Airbnb. In this graph, which represents the availability of Airbnb as a percentage of all available accommodation in Auckland, Queenstown and Christchurch, we can see the very strong rise in Christchurch in the middle of last year and it continues to increase here toward the 20% mark. There's been a shift in perhaps where the accommodation is provided and the duration of the stay. Airbnb is a disruptor. The industry as a whole needs to keep up with that and consumers are driving it. I think it's really important to understand that the Airbnb revolution is not being driven by people like myself providing the accommodation, it's being driven by consumers that want to use the accommodation. 
And so it's really important to understand that it's driven by demand. The idea of Cantabrians especially having uh, pride of being a good host and the sense of manaakitanga that they have allows us through channels like Airbnb to tell the story of Christchurch in a different way that maybe we would otherwise not be able to do. Right, well look, thank you Steve. Is my mic working again? Good, everyone can hear me? Thanks Steve for that. I think what the Airbnb story um, indicates to me very strongly is not just those changing patterns within our visitor economy, but also the power of disruption. From zero market share to 20% in just 18 months. That demonstrates just how quickly disruption can occur. Now, if any of you are in the retail sector, you will no doubt be thinking very, very carefully about the impending disruption of Amazon. Those in the transport sector have also been disrupted, as have media uh, profoundly. Everybody in this room should be thinking about disruption. Everybody in this room should be thinking about technological disruption and understanding how we are going to harness that as a community. So if we now turn back to the economy and some of the forecasts, some of the things that we are expecting to happen over the next uh, 12 months. So as I mentioned earlier, that rebuild stimulus that we have experienced post-quake really did peak in 2014 and we have seen a softening uh, across that uh, portion of the economy ever since. Whilst construction does still remain strong and an important part of our economy, it will continue to plateau and decline and it will continue to, to, in time, return to pre-quake levels. So it's likely, we believe, that GDP growth will continue to cool over 2018 as that construction sector continues to fall away. And this will only be partially offset by growth in other sectors. As you can see from the indices behind me, we are seeing a softening, or forecasting rather, a softening in those key indices um, uh, at every point. So a softening in terms of a rise in unemployment, um, a decline in net migration that could be exacerbated to further changes to the migration settings, and a decline in GDP growth. Now the picture for Canterbury is much the same because as we know the Canterbury economy is um, inherently linked and fueled by the Christchurch economy. So a similar picture once we start to look at it from a region-wide perspective. What this forecast demonstrates to me is the real risk posed if this government doesn't adequately invest in the rebuild and getting the job done. The Canterbury economy contributes 12% to the national GDP and we are the powerhouse that drives the South Island regional economy. A stagnation of the Canterbury economy will have a flow on effect both from a regional point of view and a national point of view. And we view that any underinvestment in this community will lead to a further loss of confidence. We believe that it's essential that central governments support local authorities to complete the outstanding anchor projects with pace, with a clear scope and clear timelines. The risk of uncertainty, we believe, is too great. Wellington, quite simply, cannot take its foot off the gas with regard to Canterbury. The Regeneration Minister, Megan Woods, has been very clear in terms of her view. She wants a faster and concrete progress on the Canterbury recovery. She signalled that her government wants action and momentum. But this needs to come with appropriate financial support in order to partner with our local authorities to do the job properly. It needs to come with support from her Cabinet colleagues, and this is the message that we will be continuing to reinforce at every opportunity. This shouldn't be viewed as a handout for Christchurch. It should be viewed as an investment in our regional economies and an investment in New Zealand. Meanwhile, all of us in this room need to really understand that disruption picture. We need to understand that our economy is softening and we need to make sure that we are taking every opportunity to grow green shoots to supplement our traditional areas of strength. 
We need to understand tech disruption. We need to understand technology. And we need to prioritise research and innovation. And a little bit more on that in a minute. So some of those economic top lines then. We have had steady GDP growth driven in part by a, um, a, the underlying economy. We still have high levels of activity across the city, and that's really good news. We still have, at this point, continuing strong migration. We have robust employment growth in some of those sectors beyond construction, and again, really good news. We do still have low levels of unemployment and good economic growth rates right across the region. And looking forward, we see real potential in our emerging prominence as a test bed for new innovation and also new technologies. We know that disruptive technology is going to continue to make an impact, and we are forecasting that further softening uh, in the economy as our rebuild economy continues to ease. So in summary then, business as usual will lead to a further softening. We cannot sit on our hands. We need to continue, all of us in this room, to stimulate the market. We know that our ageing population will create a labour gap that will not be uh, replaced just by us reproducing ourselves. Over the next 15 years, rapid disruptive change will occur and that acceleration will just continue. But we have an opportunity here in Christchurch to establish ourselves as a city which embraces technology, embraces disruption, has a low carbon footprint and is a place to try new things. We already have a strong base, a strong innovation base. We have incredibly strong tertiary institutions with strong research within them. We have strong research institutions. We have an innovative business sector and wide ecosystem support uh, provided by not only Christchurch NZ, but also a really strong Canterbury Employers Chamber of Commerce. But we need to improve our overall ecosystem. We now need to translate these fledgling green shoots of innovation into economic prosperity by ramping up our activity and ensuring genuine critical mass. We need to make sure we capitalise on this government's sentiment, prioritising innovation in research and development. We need to be well placed as a community to take advantage of R&D tax credits. So there's a few levers that we as Christchurch NZ can pull. Given that forecast softening, we are mandated to pull these levers. And I want to be very clear that we are an agency that not only thinks, that not only commentates, that not only talks, but do, does. We are an agency of doers. We will have a strong, action-oriented approach. But I thought I'd just very quickly talk about when we intervene and when we don't. We can't be all things to all people. We will not solve everybody's woes. We are a public sector entity and we must make sure that we use ratepayer and taxpayer money wisely. And everything we do actually makes a difference. And we're being very, very clear as we review our activity that if it doesn't make a difference, we will not be doing it. So we have to be targeted and focused. We need to ensure that our activity supports the public sector and doesn't compete. So we will only intervene when our intervention will lead to market growth or where there is a genuine market failure and where we think intervention is appropriate. So I'm just going to talk very briefly before I release you for a cup of coffee and networking about some of the things that you can expect from us. So, in the innovation and business growth space, which we view as of high priority, we are working with others to ensure that Christchurch is a place where it is easy to do business, where businesses are supported with knowledge, with know-how to be more effective and to cope with future technologies uh, and workforce innovation, to make sure these things are front of mind. We run a range of programs ourselves, and I would invite you to connect anybody who you think will benefit from it with those programs. And we're currently linking these up to form a growth funnel so that um, we have levels of activity through which people can progress from startups and people looking to commercialise research right through to um, very high level support for businesses with high growth capacity. And also making sure that we are working hard to demonstrate to international companies that Christchurch is a place to come and try new things, to innovate and to prototype and experiment. We're working closely with central government in this respect and with MB in particular. 
So it's our vision that Christchurch is viewed as New Zealand's unparalleled prototype city. The place where it makes sense to trial new technologies and new ways of working. And this vision supports our existing strengths. It supports our manufacturing sector and our primary sector, which we know are very important to our ongoing economic strength. So we, as I say, we believe Christchurch can strengthen its profile as a testbed for future innovation. And we're not just making this up. We, uh, to support this, we are pulling together an index of all of our innovation strengths in commercial, research and education to help us focus our activities and we'll be sharing this widely with all of you. In the future we won't be all things to all people, but we'll be focused on the industries and initiatives that op offer opportunities for growth and game-changing technology that raises our profile nationally and internationally. Now we've started to do this work and we're seeing some interesting trends arrive. Uh, arise, rather. We've got some strength in computer gaming, in AR and VR applications, in new transport technologies, in space and Antarctic research. I've learned a whole lot more about both those things in the last four weeks. Uh, we've got strength in the technical outdoor clothing industry. Uh, we've got some world-leading brands based right here in Christchurch. And we've got strength in the radio technology and power electronics sector. Now we're continuing to do this work, we're continuing to start to really hone in on those areas of potential strength and growth. Excuse me. Now I thought I'd uh, quickly uh, move to our visitor strategy because all of this is not just about new technology and growing business, it's also about attracting more visitors and they are tourists, business visitors, convention goers and international students. We have an, a, a, a visitor strategy which sets out a framework for Christchurch to really regain our pre-earthquake share of the national visitor economy. To make sure we enhance the visitor experience here, we target the right visitors at the wrong time, at the right time, not the wrong time. Um, and the reason for that, of course, is we could do lots of things in lots of different markets. Um, but unless we're being really, really focused on our activity, we're not getting the biggest bang for our buck. And we also are working hard to ensure that our visitor sector has the right infrastructure and is supported by our local people. And that's all about that social license to operate. There's no point us doing a whole lot of work attracting visitors here if we're not able to offer them the right infrastructure and as a consequence they butt up against uh, locals and diminish the experience here in the city. Uh, we've got a vigorous program of activity which encompasses offshore marketing, trade and media for mills, and local advocacy for stronger visitor attractions. And we're also working with tourism businesses to grow their capability. So they're not hokey, they're not just mom and pop operators, but they are truly professional, authentic experiences for the people we welcome here. And we're working really closely with some of our key partners, Tourism New Zealand, Christchurch International Airport, uh, the tourism industry Aotearoa, and of course the airlines, to make sure that we're getting people here and we're giving them a good experience. And to just give you a little uh, picture of the shape of uh, the challenge that we're facing, uh, these figures indicate visitor numbers pre and post quake, 2010 through to 2017. And you can see that um, in terms of the share of international visitor arrivals into New Zealand, we had a beautiful 21% pre quake and we're down to just 14% now. We need to do a whole heap of work to improve that picture. So as I said, we're not just talkers, we're doers. Um, here's an example of something we are doing right now. This is a new campaign that we launched in partnership with Christchurch International Airport, Qantas Holidays and Tourism New Zealand uh, just a few weeks ago. It's called Christchurch and Next to No Time. It's all about inviting Aussies over the ditch five days here in the South Island. Boom, what a great experience they can have. And that campaign's going really well. Major events also really, really important part of growing the experience here in Christchurch, improving our destination and improving uh, the offering that attracts people uh, internationally. So, sorry, nationally. So we're developing a major event strategy and uh, we added our commitment to grow a portfolio of major events that really makes this an exciting place to live and visit. It's not our ambition to own events, that hasn't always worked out so well in the past. We are really committed to helping the private sector do the job well and supporting them to do that, making this an easy place um, to put on events and make sure those events are sustainable. So we're executing or supporting the execution of 15 major events this year, uh, which makes my head spin a little bit because um, I'm going to a lot of events. 
Um, all of these are really good events, uh, and they are already well supported, both internationally and uh, sorry, both nationally and locally. Um, these include the Buskers Festival, the Lantern Festival. We've got um, some really high-profile sporting events, including um, One Day Cricket Internationals, Rugby League World Cup, and of course the Coast to Coast, which is a tremendous event. But we have big ambitions. We are currently reimagining what the Buskers Festival should look like after 25 very good years in the city. Um, we're in the process of developing our thinking around a major food event that really attracts people to this region. We're looking at new events in uh, spring and autumn to improve the offering throughout the year. And we're developing a really exciting program around Tech Week, which we hope will have some tremendous speakers and really start to reinforce that view of Christchurch as a place to try new things. And this brings me very finally, because I can hear you shuffling in your chairs, you're keen for that coffee, very finally to the story that we tell about ourselves, the Christchurch narrative. We have inherited responsibility to develop the story that we tell about ourselves, and I consider this an incredibly important and exciting piece of work. So we're in the process of working with people right across the city as we develop and seek to define our city's truly aspirational vision. It's a vision that must be realistic, it must be consistent, it must resonate with our community, but it also must define our future aspirations. Our city is already beautifully described in myriad ways, from city of opportunity, a 21st century city, and of course, a garden city. But we know that our truly unique proposition is rooted in the, in the themes of being a place to grow, connect, and find balance. And we've inherited a beautiful piece of work led by Christchurch International Airport in that respect. So we're now working to tighten that up further to develop that truly unique selling point excuse me, that encompasses some of those themes of experimentation, innovation, and being a place to try new things, which is a chance that has really been given to us in this post-quake environment. So all of the work that we've been discussing today underlines, I hope, the importance of that piece of work and the importance of embracing a narrative that is about growth, that is about innovation, and is about trying new things. This is a place I believe that we can not only live great lives, and I know that all of us really truly appreciate the lifestyle benefits of living here in Christchurch, but also a place where we push boundaries, where we don't have to take a back seat in our careers, where we don't have to um, simply accept a softening of the economy, where we can take action to try new things. So these concepts will form the basis of our Christchurch story. We'll keep you up to date as we develop this. We hope to have that clear USP locked down by very early next year. And it will be an aspirational story that articulates exactly what is special about this place, this amazing, experimental, pioneering, and beautiful 21st century city that we all call home. So thank you. I'm incredibly grateful for your attention today. Um, we're really proud of the work that Christchurch NZ has the opportunity to do for our city and for our visitors. We have a very clear focus, and that is to serve you. We're committed to ensuring that everybody who lives, visits, and does business with Christchurch understands this is a place to try new things. We are committed to growing confidence, connecting change makers, creating excitement, and igniting bold ambition for Autotahi Christchurch. Thank you. So I'd now like to invite briefly up onto the stage um, members of our senior leadership team, and we are happy to answer all of your questions, and please don't hold back. You know how much I like to ask questions. Um, so welcome back onto the stage, Steve Purdia, and also our General Manager for Attractions, Linda Folwasser, and our GM for Destination and Market, Destination Marketing, Rowan Warner, who you saw earlier in the Airbnb video. Now, if you wouldn't mind um, waiting for a mic before you ask your questions so that the live stream and the video can pick up your question. Hi there. Just in reference to the real estate stats, is the widening of the gap between Christchurch and the rest of the company in terms of prices, isn't that just the uh, Auckland market moving away from the rest of the country? Can I answer that, Steve? Sure. 
Yeah, uh, it's a very, very good point. But um, actually, other regions in New Zealand have been experiencing strong house price growth, whereas uh, Christchurch, as a, as a large city, a metropolitan city in New Zealand, um, hasn't been experiencing that same growth. And also, it's been um, going on for a couple of years. So I think there is a little bit more to that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Auckland's had really strong growth, and Auckland does drive that New Zealand picture. But actually, other large centres in New Zealand have been experiencing pretty strong growth over the last three years. I, I appreciate that you said that we need to get on and sort out some of the ANC projects and what's happening in the CBD. It's quite clear, though, that some of the projects are not going to be completed anytime soon. How is that going to affect the appeal uh, of our inner city to tourists who at the moment appear to be coming into town, hiring a car and going to Queenstown? Kia ora, well, thank you for your question. It's a really good question. I think as a community, we need to be very clear that we're starting to talk less about the things we don't have and more about the things that we do. We have a fantastic offering here in Christchurch, and um, if I can reflect on the things that I'm able to do on the weekends in terms of walking in the Port Hills, go to the beaches, those are same experiences that are available to our visitors. So we need to be much more confident in telling the story about what's on offer here. Um, I think the reflection that people are simply jumping in a car and going to Queenstown is not entirely true. We do have strong visitor numbers here in Christchurch, and um, some of the numbers that we're seeing indicate that. But that real conviction around telling the, the experience that is on offer uh, is a key priority of Christchurch NZ. Great question. Um, the numbers that you showed at the end with visitor share, uh, we saw in terms of raw numbers, they're relatively similar post-quake versus pre-quake, but our visitor percentage share dropped to 14%. So how does that look uh, with regards to taking into account the rest of the South Island um, in terms of you know, the different regions such as Southland, Otago, Central Lakes, Tasman, etc.? Sorry, I just missed the start of that question. Is that... Did you hear that question? Yeah. I think that... Um, I think maybe we might have to do a little bit more digging to have a look at how that's looking for some of those outlying regions. Obviously, in terms of the share that Queenstown's seen, that's seen significant growth. Um, and it, the dynamics of the rest of the South Island have been very mixed in terms of how those visitor flows have been moving around the rest of the South Island. So in, those, in the years post-quake, things like uh, the top of the South, we've been putting a lot of emphasis about trying to move visitors in different ways than they would otherwise have uh, outside of going through to Queenstown. So trying to move regional dispersal across the whole of the South Island. And as uh, Christchurch NZ, it is our role to assist the rest of the South Island to help do that. When you think about how visitors internationally come to New Zealand, Christchurch and Canterbury only play one part of that puzzle and we all have to work together to, to grow that share back for, for across the board for the South Island and work in partnership to do that. So we do a lot of work that uh, is aligned with some of the other regions to help grow the collective pie together. Doesn't really answer your question. <laughs> hey, look, um, um just some of the words you mentioned, Joanna, about being doers and being bold and ambitious is fantastic. Um, I guess one of the questions I've got, I mean, one of the elephants in the room for Christchurch is what's happening in the central city, but also the red zone. So we've got 600 um, hectares of land out there. What, what impact or influence does Christchurch New Zealand you know, intend to have in that area, I guess? Regenerate came out recently and, and, and you know, said that they hoped to have planned by the end of 2018. So that might mean 2019 build, you know, we're starting to get a decade down the track from, you know, doing something with this area. And I guess, you know, you, you, in here we've got reference to the bike park and some of the documentation in here, or the adventure park, sorry, not a bike park, adventure park. And I guess we see what that did for the Christchurch in six weeks. And, you know, I'm on a board for the, for the lake trust, trying to get a lake out there and things are going, you know, we just can't have this drag on for, for a decade or so. Mm. So I, I'm keen to know what sort of influence you guys will have about being doers in that area. Yeah, we work really closely with Regenerate Christchurch, and I think Ivan from Regen is here today. Um, it, look, we need to be realistic about timeframes around major infrastructure development, and Regen are in the process of consultation around land use in the residential red zone. That's an important piece of work, 
but even once those decisions are made, we won't immediately see attractions uh, leaping up within the residential red zone. So again, it comes back to being very confident and bold in telling the story around what we do have. And whilst we don't yet have new visitor attractions, for example, within the residential red zone, we do have really strong experience that we can offer. Um, in terms of influence, we are continuing in our conversations with Regen and other city partners to make sure that we emphasise the visitor experience as being essential to their thinking, so that's placing a visitor lens over the conversations that we have, and really underlying the importance of the strength of their visitor economy and the overall economic picture and the contribution it makes. Um, so I would like to think we have a lot of influence, <laughs> uh, and certainly the conversations that we've had thus far with our key partners have um, been really promising. The other key partner, of course, is Naitahu, and um, we're working really hard to support um, the activities of Naitahu within the region, but also encourage Naitahu to start to think about whether it is right to place a visitor attraction, a, a, a Naitahu tourism visitor attraction, here within Ōtatahi, and we would advocate for that. Just to reiterate and uh, follow on from what Joe said, our role too is um, in terms of looking at attraction opportunities for Christchurch and for the city. So in terms of the role we play and, and being doers, we're forecasting out four, five, six, seven years in terms of bidding for major events for the city. It takes that long to attract those real global uh, major events. So when we sit around the table and we're talking about what that facility needs, it comes with real rigour of what an event will look like in five years' time, what will attract people to buy a ticket and go to those facilities. So our conversations around that table are meaningful and based on what's right in front of us now. I think the other point I'll make there is um, we ensure that the advice that we're giving is always insight-led and evidence-based, and that's really important to us that the advice that we're giving is credible and independent. Um, and those same um, factors that Linda mentioned that we take into account, we're also feeding those into conversations around the multi-use arena and the metro sports facility, which is a really important conversation the city's having right now. What are we doing to um, connect our tech sector to the global economy out there? we we'll try and grow up from there, particularly with trying to get access to capital, which is um, obviously a bit of a challenge for some of these tech companies, particularly in the startup phase. Sorry, could you ask that question again? I just didn't quite hear it. My apologies. I was just saying, what, what are we doing with our tech sector to connect them to the global market out there to help them grow, particularly with um, capital raising, which tends to be the number one issue, particularly in the startup phase? Yeah, no, really, really good question. Um, I'll partly answer and I'm going to hand over to Linda. So we're working really hard to make sure that we have the right international connections, both with Silicon Valley and beyond, and also with China, uh, and making sure that we are viewed as an attractive place to invest. And we're actually connecting our really good ideas, because we do have good ideas here in New Zealand and within Canterbury. And we're connecting um, those ideas with the people with the capacity. And that's a, um, when you look at those pillars that I put up earlier, that connecting change makers piece is really important. The other agency with a role to play here is, of course, DCL, uh, Development Christchurch Limited, who um, have uh, a connection with a strong investor network, and we work in close partnership with them to make sure we're not duplicating work. Where do you see the uh, cruise terminal in Littleton in your work uh, as far as encouraging tourists back into the area and a very high spending group of tourists as well? Yeah, we see that as a critical piece of infrastructure and we've worked very closely with Littleton Port to continue to reinforce the, important, uh, the importance of the cruise berth uh, as part of the international gateway picture. Uh, it's really important that we do uh, have the capacity to welcome those visitors back into Littleton and also to support the smaller vessels going into Akaroa. Um, and we've also done a values assessment which takes it beyond that economic, purely economic assessment and looked at that wider benefit. I wonder if Steve, you want to speak to that briefly? Yeah, I, I think with the cruise port in Littleton, it's, it's a really good example too of where uh, we need to do some things differently in order to win back that market share of visitors into Christchurch and Canterbury. Um, and that is a really important piece of infrastructure for the city. Um, it also enables the city to um, diversify uh, its, its, its ports so you can have a large cruise port in Littleton and, and you can have other types of vessels still going into Akaroa, so you know, grow, growing the pie. But you know, it goes well beyond um, the economic value, um, and th that was a piece of work we did to try and make sense of that decision um, in, in terms of the public value and in investment into it. 
Um, it has so many other spin-off benefits, and, and probably the main one, there are a number, but the main one I'll, I'll talk about is um, the benefit to the profile of Christchurch. You know, um, uh, there is a huge amount of marketing material that goes out globally around um, ports um, for, uh, for cruise vessels. And you know, ha having your brand and, and, and trying to carefully manage that uh, to reinforce your story, and this all links back to the city narrative we've been talking about, uh, is really important. So that, that canvas you get of having crews into your city is actually a, a, a form of global, or it's a channel for global marketing for the city as well. And there are other forms of benefit that go well beyond um, just the economic value of, of having um, you know, 150 crews uh, tourists coming into Littleton each year. And we've got time for just two more questions. Carmela, kia ora. Good morning. Um, look, thank you for um, this morning. It's been really helpful to uh, understand where Christchurch is and where we're going. You called, uh, made a strong call for the government to help finish the rebuild. Um, have you done any work on exactly how much the government needs to invest? What is the, the gap between what we've committed financially to complete the anchor projects and develop the red zone and what we actually need? Have you got a figure? Yeah, really good question, Carmel. I would expect an insightful question from the acting editor of the press. Um, <laughs> we haven't quantified that because it really det um, is determined by the shape of the multi-use arena and the facilities that go within that and the decisions that are made around um, whether to incorporate aspects of metro sports in that. Um, Council and DPMC are doing an interesting piece of work um, to truly understand what the shape of that should look like. And the minister's been very clear that she wants that work accelerated. Um, so we'll continue to support that, but we are um, in the background starting to form some views around that values assessment piece and the benefit to the wider community, and we'll keep communicating that uh, as that work is finished. Yeah, kia ora Joe. really pleased to hear uh, <coughs> a lot of discussion around the wider benefits beyond economic. So I'm interested in what explicit activities we're doing to support the growth of the impact economy. We're, we know that internationally we're seeing a lot of turn towards things like the sustainable development goals we're seeing, divesting from fossil fuels, lots of interesting stuff. And then in the, in the more local context, we've got this Avonotakata River Corridor, which fundamental to the development will be social and environmental returns in tandem with economic development. We've just had the Social Enterprise World Forum here, the principal global conversation for a lot of this sort of stuff. So I'm interested, what sort of intentional activities is Christchurch NZ going to be taking to support, uh, support the development of an economy that benefits the environment and supports people to thrive? Yeah, really good question and one that plays very closely to my own heart. I mean, the benefit of having that social enterprise forum and the kind of conversations that are occurring within the city off the back of that are really important. And when we talk about this being a city to try new things, we very squarely see that social value piece being really central to that. We, I hope in time that this quarterly update will be a place where we can report around some of those social value measures as well as the purely economic value. Um, and we are looking at how we build social enterprise into our core of um, our business support. Um, so that, that pillar around innovation and business growth, making sure that uh, sustainability and purpose-led um, economic development is very much a part of that. Really great question. Watch the space very firmly on our radar. Just one more question. Hello, we've had some um, fantastic new roading um, released recently, which is great. I'm just wondering what the role is that Christchurch NZ will take in public transport, and particularly for our visitor populations. <coughs> Uh, we don't have a direct responsibility for public transport, but the way people move around the city is of interest to us, so we're continuing to work with the Christchurch City Council, again, helping um, all of our partners understand the importance of a good public transport network to our visitor economy specifically. From an economic development point of view, we also have an interest in the development of autonomous vehicles and um, uh, um, other related technology, and that's one of those areas of strength that we're starting to see emerge as we do that innovation mapping. Great. Well, look, thank you all very much again for your time. I'm incredibly grateful you got out of bed early to come and listen to us. Please now do take the opportunity to network if you wish, and we've got coffee and light breakfast served in the foyer. Thank you again.